This message comes to you from King's Church Wirral, UK. We hope that as you listen, you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. Well, good morning. Uh, we're continuing our new teaching series this morning. We're looking at a community of God. Uh, last week, when we started this, we explored why community is so central to the heart of God, why it matters so much to do. We also looked at what it means to be his image bearers and the fact that it is not possible to be an image bearer on our own. You can't bear the image of God when you're alone. And we looked at that from the idea that God being himself a community. To reflect God, we must be the community he desires us to be. We also looked at the fact that the central idea that that community is going to be built around is the confession of Peter, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. John Mark Comber, former pastor of Bridgetown Community Church, Current leader of the Practicing the Way movement recently said that the single greatest issue facing the world today is whether or not those who identify as Christians will become disciples, practitioners, students, and followers of Jesus the Messiah. Jesus said many things during his time on earth, continues to speak today, continued to speak to the early church, still speaks today. And he directly challenged cultural norms. Things that everybody just took as assumed ways of being. Jesus came in and he said, it's not the way I want to do it. It upset lots of people. And partly, well, that's the reason he was killed. Because he upset the cultural norms of the day. There's absolutely no reason to think that his teachings would not continue to do that today and challenge the status quo of this present cultural moment. And as such, I just want to start by saying, no matter how far along a journey with Jesus you are, mm -hmm. you may have only just met him, you may just be exploring who this Jesus fellow is, or you may have been following him for 50 or 60 years, you will are all on a journey out of one way of understanding the world back into Jesus' way of understanding the world. What that means is there are times that we are exploring Jesus that we're confronted with stuff that we would naturally struggle with. As his followers, what we try to do is lay down our way and think of this. If we do this and we support one another, we are going to look more and more like an authentic community of God, which is what we're aiming for. So today we're going to look at something that Jesus said about community. And just to give you a little fairly with me, it has the possibility to discomfort us, and that's so it is. In fact, if anything, it's good. So I really want to encourage you today on this show, with our hearts for God to challenge you be, with regards to whatever responsibility you would like to have to try and live out, and really try to avoid the attitude that says, they really need to hinder that. Yeah? But rather, let us take it on many me to hear this, so that we become disciples, practitioners, students, and followers of Jesus. As my mom would say, there are two ways to listen to a word. There is with a rate, and there is with an itch folk. The rate pulls it towards yourself. The pitch part folk throws it to someone else. We want to listen, you know, the rate. What is this for me? So we're going to be looking at the principle of God's community that we are a family. Family to a real central theme of scripture, starting with the unity of Eden between Adam and the woman, picking up with Abraham and Sarah, the bloodline that led to the nation of Israel. God's chosen people through the Old Testament. We also see that God has family as a carrier for his work in mankind and the world. Jesus himself was placed into family. It would have been perfectly possible if God can do a virgin birth, it would have been perfectly possible for God to just create 
Jesus out of nothing. But he didn't. He placed Jesus in a family. Jesus had a mother. He had an earthly father. Jesus had aunts and uncles that are named in scripture. Following Jesus' birth, Joseph and Mary got married. They had other children. Jesus had brothers and sisters that he was raised in love with. Jesus was placed into family. And then in Matthew 12, verse 36, something happens. I'll read. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are outside wanting to speak to you. Very accurate and good laying on the situation. He appointed it. Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Him and my mother are blessed. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. In another story, Jesus makes a statement from the same view of family where he says in Mark 10, 28, it says, Peter stood up and said, We've left everything to follow you. Should I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution, and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus makes it clear, right, that to follow him means to have a shift in perspective over family life. In the first passage, right, his mother, men, this woman nursed him. This woman taught him. This woman raised him, fed him, loved him. And his brothers, he would have played with these people as a child in the streets outside his home. They'd have probably rammed him up and he may have wound them up in return. The brothers do that. They arrive and they want to speak to him. Now at the time, if you read the story, that is nowhere near. Where Jesus is, is nowhere near at the home. It's a long way from where they've lived. So clearly, Mary and the brothers have traveled with the message. But we're not told what that message is. But Jesus uses this moment to land the truth about his kingdom. If you take my father as your father, you become my family. By extension, therefore, anybody who shares Jesus' father as their father, our family with one another. To great encouragement, isn't it? We are family. We are led. We are family. You are my brothers and sisters and children and mothers and grandparents. Some of you are looking at me going, bad. you stretch a bit to think that at your age you can still claim with grandparents, but I'm going with it anyway. I'm doing. Now, what the hard thing about this statement is, it means that when we take his father as our father, our father we are stepping out of the life we had in all of its entirety and stepping into the life he offers us. Yeah? And what he is stating in that process is your genetic connection of no longer finality or family, your spiritual connections are the father. It's not about having genetic shared parenting. It's a new family built on an eternal connection with the heavenly father. In Mark, when he speaks in the same respect of believing one family type and thinking another, it's interesting, he says, if you leave home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields, well, I'm a hundred times as much in the present age. 
what do we receive a hundred times of? We receive a hundred times ohms when we're in this fathom. I ask, what's that look like? Well, I tell you what it looks like. It looks like my lung is your home. That's what it looks like. My lung is your home. Just like if my sister showed up at my door on the bottom side as a nice little tell down the road. The family connection means they are welcome. My home is your home. We receive a hundred times brothers and sisters. We receive a hundred times brothers and children and fields, but we also receive the persecutions that go with the idea of shifting our family perspective. Now, what you don't see, there is a difference between these two lists of what is left and what is gained. And the difference is father's. Father is mentioned in the list of what is left but it's not mentioned in the list of what is gained. And the reason for that is because in order to join this family, we don't receive a hundred fathers, we receive Jesus' father. We only get one father. This family only has one father, not a hundred fathers. I want to be clear with you on something, though, because when I was, when I was preparing this, I was thinking, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Jesus is not saying it. That to become part of this family, you are supposed to put up any connections or relationships. It's not, he's not saying that. That would speak against the character of Jesus. Jesus does not say, shun people. Jesus does not say, snub people. He doesn't say that. So it would be against the character. Rather, what he seems to be saying is that it's about your primary place of connectivity. Your main family. This is the bit which rubs against our cultural framework, yeah? Do you, do you feel it? You feel a bit of a discomfort listening to this, I think. It rubs against the cultural framework that we have. What he's saying is, to, as his follower, your main family connection is the shared heavenly father, not a shared DNA profile. But the connection you have with those who call God Father joins you the two then in a way that the Lord cannot join you to know. It's a deeper, truer, and more intimate family than blood connection than man. Now let me tell you this, family is not easy. I know everybody here, they love their family, but you've got to admit, it's not easy. In fact, interestingly, if you look through scripture, the almost every single, well, not almost every single, loads and loads of massive disagreements, really big splits that go on in the story of scripture happen between brothers. Cain and Abel, what murders the other one? The first two brothers in the story, one of them murders the other one. Like, that's not my God, all family. He's offering us something better than that. Isaac and, like, yeah, uh, Isaac and Esau. Breaking in brothers, the, the children is stolen mode, breaking in brothers, the stick the nation of Israel. Oh, I went over and over. Brothers fall out with each other all the time, yeah? Family's not easy. It's not all gonna be sweet smelling roses. Family is nuanced, it's hard and it's uncomfortable. But God's family brings security, it brings love, it brings growth, it brings mutual joy. I would say you laugh more, cry more, argue more, and forgive more in family than in any other social setting. You know, while I was in Swansea, I shared a flat with a couple of friends called Chris and Lorna. And when we first did, it was just a little walk. And me and, me and Chris uh, were both from multi-child families. I've got a brother and a sister here. I'd like to read brothers, I think, maybe a sister. And Lorna was an only child. She you know, grew up as a lone the alone girl living in her house. And we, we were just going for his walk. We made it, me and Chris just made one little journey at Lorna's expense. Oh, she did not take it well. We were friends, but she did not take it well. When me and Chris looked into it, we were like, that wasn't much. We didn't really push very hard though, what was going on. And we thought that she'd never know what it was to have brothers. She didn't know what having a brother was like. So me and Chris actually sat down. We talked to each other, me and Chris, and we sat down and we said, we're probably going to live with each other for at least a year. We're going to tell you, we're going to be your brothers this year. And let's tell you what that means. That means that when it's the three of us, because you're our little sister, you're going to be the brother of every child. 
you're going to be prodded and posed. Wait, you're not tired. We're going to have no patience with that. We're just going to, we're going to be like, oh, I'm just around the carcass there. Oh, we're going to do that over and over. But we also said, but let me tell you this. Anybody else in your life tries that and we'll have you back. We're not the only ones that your brothers are allowed to do that, but we are going to do it. You know what? I think maybe I was a little bit immature in that. I probably wasn't the best player to do a situation. I'm not defending that as a way uh, I was a lot younger, but I want to say having a family nature of connection that year transformed Borna. She went from something, uh, she, if, she, if she listens to this, she'll probably read me up and argue with me on it, but she went from something who was not very resilient to something who was very resilient. It grew that having me got in just loved her whilst also uh, acting in that way. Um, I've still got a great relationship with her to this day. Yeah, I want to encourage us that God wants us at Kingshed to be a family. Tyler Stater recently said that the Western Church understands what it is to be brothers positionally, but not relationally. Put simply, we know how to call ourselves family, but we're not really good at living it. Our community here, in this room, it has grandparents. It has parents. It has singles. It has married. It has children. We are truly a multi-generational group in this room. Yet Jesus calls us to be more than family in name only. He does not want each other. He does not want us to call each other brother or mother or child. He wants us to be brother, sister, and mother, and child to each other. And there is a difference between taking the label and living the last. When Zadok was born, I became a dad. Steph became a mum. And Zadok later Asa were born with parents and grandparents. You know, the name dad is not just a title I'm not like entertain myself. If I'm doing it properly, I can't pick that up and put it down when it suits me. I can't say actually on a Tuesday I'm too busy to be a dad. And therefore I can't be a dad on that day. I don't have that option. Do you see that once? Colin and Liz. They have they have non-optional responsibilities to Zadok and Asa. Not optional. They are grandparents, right? I mean, I mean, I, I, I think I mentioned before when 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 they were first born, uh, we were thinking about like babysitting, and I me and Steph had a bit of a conversation about this, and I, I'm not sure we ever related this to Colin. I'm not sure that this might be the first time it's happened. Uh, but when the Steph was talking, about, I don't, I don't, you know, can't put on him too much. Although like, we're not putting on the grandparents, stop putting on grandparents. Third to be grandparents. We're not asking them to do us a favour. They're grandparents. Now, obviously, we know that. We've got good friends and relationship with them. But I stand by that. Like, just in the same way I have non-optional responsibilities as a dad, Colin is have non-optional responsibilities as grandparents. It's part of the, it's part of the package. Yeah. Different, but it's part of the package. These connections carry little different levels of input, but... In blood family, what's clear is that when it's healthy and functioning, there is no opt-out option. Now, I have also recognised there are no healthy functioning families. There are places where families are not healthy and functioning. But let's take the ideal as our model, because it's God's family. It's not an opt-out opt option. It is just what you are. Yeah? Sure. I think Jesus would have us step into his community and take the same non actual responsibilities to one another. No older people in this room. Parents of small children need you. They need you in their lives. They might not know that they need you, and they might not ask you for it, but they need you nonetheless. You need to insist on it. You need to insist on being the grandparent and the parent in the room. Because we don't always know that we need you, but we do. When I was a younger man in Birmingham, there were men, there were quite them, there weren't many. There weren't any old people in the church. See, Birmingham's a major city, and old people, being honest, ended to retire to the countryside. So they'd grow up in the city, they'd work in the city, they'd retire, and then it'd be too hard to live in the city. So there weren't that many people who were old in, in, in the church in Birmingham. But there were a few I'd like to mention. The first one was a man called Mike Fuller. Mike died of cancer about... 
oh, eight, nine, ten years ago, something like that. Um, Mike was not my blood relative, yeah? He was not my blood relative. So, but he insisted on being a grandparent in the church, right? Every single week, Mike, who's quite a cheeky chat, he's still up. I mean, because he was trying to hide the fact he bought a massive bag of sweets with him to the kids. And all the parents were like, don't give them sweets, they go nuts. He's like, yeah, but... You know, you never noticed that grandparents have got the ability to just magically make sweets appear out of their pockets where the kids are like, that's it. Yeah, they just do. Stop that, there's always a lollipop in their pocket. And I don't know where they cut this spot. Oh, I'm looking at They sometimes on their belly, so I'm like, hey, so let you get that. I don't know. But, but I think they have this amazing ability to just don't on the children. Just absolutely don't on the children. And Mike was like this. He would say hello to every single child every single week. And they'd all come out of their groups at the end of the session. They'd come from various different places around the building. They'd run to Mike. Can I have my sweets, Mike? And I was like, well, you've got to say hello to me first. He was insistent that he would be the granddad in the church. Absolutely insistent on it. But he also fulfilled his role as a real seasoned follower of Jesus. And he did that to me. There was one time when I was first coming into any level of leadership in church, you know what, mine sat me down on a Sunday and said, Ben, it isn't good enough, Ben. He said, I'm an old man, you're a young man. You were supposed to be passionate. You were supposed to be directed. You were supposed to be reckless. I wasn't supposed to be the one who's telling you back with wisdom. And at the moment, I'm trying to G you up all the time. He says, you're not the son you old. My job, he said, I've worked hard in this church for a long time. I'm supposed to be in a position well, I'm trying to slow you down with a bit of wisdom. And at the moment, I feel like I'm still going to work hard just to get you to stand up. And you know what? One of the most formative things anybody has ever said to me in my life. It altered me on a Sunday morning over coffee because he insisted on his role to my life. I never asked for it. There was another couple in the church. They're still very strong. They're still in leadership down there. When I was at all about the age of 14... They would have me and a couple of my friends from the youth group around the Sunday lunch every now and then. We loved it. We got to go out with our parents. It was great. They helped raise me. And you know what? These two, Alan and Linda, they taught me how to serve in church. That's what they did. They taught me how to serve. You know how they did it? They did not make me part of their team. They did not say you need to join this team. They didn't do that. What they did was they drew me close relationally and they served. And because I was close enough, I saw it. That's all that it was. They just were who God wanted them to be, but they were relationally connected to me, which grew me. Yeah? Right. Then that couple paid for my first term's fee to Bible College. I never asked for that. I didn't go into them and say, hey, I know you love me, can I have a loan? And they came up to you and says, We've got responsibility to you. You've been in here. We've seen what God's doing, and you would like to pay the first term of buying colleges. I wasn't a small one, I love it. They knew they had a non optional position to play. You know, I had great Christian parents, but I was raised by a community where older people knew that there was no opt out into my life. Similarly, you know, if you take the image of brothers and sisters in Christ, it's easy. It is really easy to look at somebody and say, you're my brother in Christ. That doesn't take any anything real. It's a really easy thing to say. Well, I wonder how much I actually know of that. How much do I actually know some people who I call my brothers and sisters in Christ? Do I know your life and your loves, your pains and your joys? I can only move from having family in name only to authentic family by desiring a community that reflects what Jesus desires for the community. But it is hard for this family. It means having, it means allowing you to invade parts of my life and me invading some of yours. You know? Yeah, a few years ago, I uh, had to make a journey to. Birmingham, there's a bit of a weird one. Um, uh, Nick and Gareth were living in Birmingham at the time. They needed to get up to the wheel and their car broke down. Right? It was like really late, really last minute. So I was like, I'm not to go and get them. They have to be here. So I jumped to the car. I drove down. And on the way, I thought, why not? I'm lifting in my sisters. 
So okay. that's funny. She had no idea I was coming. It could have been an horribly inconvenience to her. It could have been an absolute nightmare of a moment to show up. I rang the doorbell, and when the door answered, she looked at me, smiled, burst into tears, and made me a cup of tea. See, that's what family looks like. It doesn't look like, oh, I'm sorry, this is inconvenient right now. It could have been the worst time in the world. I know I'm going to get invited in at that moment, because that's what family looks like, yeah? And God says he wants us to be family. We've got to be better at being invaded by people, and we need to probably be better at being inconvenienced, because that's what family looks like. Not always, but it does. We need to have an intentionality about not remaining on the peripheral of the community. And we need to have an intentionality about not allowing people to remain on the peripheral of the community. One of the things I might make an observation about our community is here, I think we're really good at welcoming people. Somebody walks through our door for the first time, they're probably going to know the names of half a dozen people in about 20 seconds. We know their children, if they got them, will be introduced to our children's workers. We know family, we could have welcome it. I might suggest we're not quite as good yet at integrating people. But people get welcomed. But do they get brought in deeply to who we are? How many times do we intentionally ask somebody to come and eat with us? To share a meal, come into my home, be part of who I am. And I want to come into your home, be part of who you are. You know, when Jesus called his disciples, you read the book of Luke and you just watch how often he made them eat with each other. All the way through Luke, Jesus is eating with his disciples and they became family. Families have no peripherals. The shyest toddler. The most angsty teen, the most insecure son in law, a woody uncle, the overbearing matriarch, the disabled, the broken, the funny, and the serious, and all in between are included. Invited and celebrated. No peripheral in family. So if we agree that Jesus' desire for his people is to be a family with the Father as the point of commonality, we have to consider what adjustments we need to make so that we are making that happen. So we are not in there, aren't we? You know, paying to the room, I'd ask you, how do you make sure that there are spiritual grandparents in your life helping you raise your children? It's a responsibility for Christian parents to be sponsored. We need back to family, yeah? You know, another thing about life is just remember this. Another thing about life. The kids, we had lots of toddlers in Birmingham at one point. There must have been about 30. It was a huge amount of toddlers. And they were loud. Oh, I wish you could barely have a Sunday morning worship. It was so loud. And they were all given instruments and they all swam around screaming. And it was absolutely pandemonium. And they'd be, they'd be running around up here. Everything was going on. You know what my did as an older man? He bought himself a tangly and he hauled them to himself because he knew the parents found it hard. He really knew the parents found that hard. So he said, I'm going to help. He bought himself a tangly. In fact, he bought a whole box of tambourines and he got the kids around them every Sunday. I mean, having all their affection was sweet to the kids rather than he lit them in tambourines. It wasn't a granddad. He stood the side down. I don't know what parents are looking after. I don't know what's going on. He's the one who went, I've got, I've got responsibility here too. I'm going to do that. I'm going to help the parents. And the parents were like, thank you. Thank you. Give you one hour without the screaming noise. It, it's part of how the family operates. I really love you in the heart of this. I'm not, I'm not wanting here to, uh, I really tried not to kind of lay blame anywhere. That's not the heart. The heart is what needs to happen in each of us in the change of practice so that we stop only calling one another family and we step into what Jesus has said in his community is, which is the family united around the Father. Family is a real principle of God's choosing. 
family not based on heritage, but shared family. Yeah. We are brought into this family. John says this in the, in the opening chapter of his gospel. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor human decision, nor husband's will, but cause on God. We're in this family not because of natural descent. We're dealt with in this family by our mutual heavenly father, and we have to align our living behind that identity trait. If that's who we are, we have to step out. We have to let that rub against our cultural norms. We have to say, oh, my, I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like. I don't even know necessarily how to do that. I'm not sure where the balance in. Is that all fine? Just don't say it's not what called actor. Because it is. Don't settle for Lex Stonecler's factors. Now, last week, I, uh, I finished the word by encouraging you, Franks, I encourage you to go and have coffee with somebody who you don't usually have a coffee with. Yeah, do you remember that? I was really pleased to say it. Actually, I, I was a little bit delayed for that. Well, I can now, but yeah, people are sat in different places. That's true. How be that? I'd like to know maybe uh, a step further. I want to encourage you to do that again. You know what? I'll tell you something. Uh, Al, you know, Al, he's my best man. I see Al every Sunday night. Every Sunday, me and Al spend time with each other. And you know what we do more than anything else? We talk about how hard being a husband and a dad is. And we love one another. And we support one another through that. And then we play some computer days. And it's a wonderful night for me. It does really good. It's proper brother. Right? Do you know what I don't prioritize having a coffee with on a Sunday? Al, because I'm going to see him Sunday night. I've got all the relationships I want to look at, and I don't get that time with all the time. That's why, that's what looking like the family looks like. It's getting the time where we can. But I'll encourage you to tweet. Maybe, sometimes you have a time of ministry there. Maybe a good time of ministry today. Mate. If everybody got their diaries out and organised when you're next going to have a meal with each other, when are you going to have some all round? When you get asked somebody you maybe you haven't spent much time with, you're going to sit them down, you're going to cook them some food, you're going to get to know them. When are you going to uh, look to that cross generational support? How are we going to bring people into our lives who currently aren't private? This, if, if the real practical thing, I'm not saying we're going to do that, but I'd encourage you to do it. To actually say, you know what? Next week, you're going to my house and tea. And we're going to know each other. Whatever it is, it requires an opt-in mentality. And it requires a responsibility. It's no good saying the reason that this isn't happening is because people aren't including information. Includes yourself. But family doesn't work that way. Yeah, family is not that. I'm, I'm going off in one of them. I just want you to hear my heart on this. I will speak in your God. It's, I'm going to pray and stop thank you because I think that I'm just going to lay in the point on the wires. But I want us to just finish to wrap in the idea But we understand who God has made us and has placed us into a family. We have no optional responsibilities to one another. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Oh, we can have It's a beautiful thing. And it was God's idea to do this. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at www.kingschurchwirral.co.uk.